That said, uh, we're going to go ahead and uh, continue our study in the Gospel of John. So if you would, open your Bibles to John chapter 1. We've been in chapter 1 for about 72 weeks now. And uh, we're actually not going to finish it this morning either, but we are getting within striking distance. So uh, if anyone needs a Bible, raise your hand. We'll make sure we get one to you. Or if anybody needs a sandwich or anything like that, we'll make sure we get one to you. So, all right. John's Gospel, chapter 1. I'm going to go ahead and read verses uh, 35 through 42, and that's where we'll be this morning. Now the next day again, John was standing with two of his disciples, and he looked at Jesus as he walked by and said, Behold, the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. Literally, they became followers of Jesus. Uh, the, Jesus turned to them and saw them following and said to them, What are you seeking? And they said to him, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? He said to them, Come, and you will see. So they came and saw where he was staying, and they stayed with him that day, for it was about the tenth hour. One of the two who heard John speak and followed Jesus was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. And he first found his own brother Simon and said to him, We have found the Messiah, which means Christ. He brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, son of John. And you shall be called Cephas, which means Peter. And fathers, we take a look at this passage and we recognize now those first ones that you called to follow you. Those first ones that met you and began to walk in your ways. We pray that uh, we would learn from them. We'd glean from this experience they had. We'd look at it, we'd digest it, and we ourselves would, with a renewed sense of purpose, take on that beautiful invitation to follow you. To come and see, as it were. And so we pray that you'd bless our time this morning, that as we open your word together, you'd open our hearts to receive it, and that, Father, you'd bring great fruit in our lives for having spent time in it. So we pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would move here among us today, and that he would draw us close to you as we come to know your word, as he guides us into these truths here this morning. Thank you, Father. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now, the next day which is the day after John now has officially declared him and revealed him as the Messiah. You remember last time we looked at it and John said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And so Jesus has now been made known to those who are within John's hearing. He's, 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 he's been revealed now as the Messiah. And so the next day comes by and John is looking and he watches as Jesus is walking by. And you have to wonder a little bit about John. He's made Jesus known. And now he's just sort of watching. What's next? What happens now? Now, of course, we mentioned before, there will come a time a little bit later in Jesus' ministry, uh, not long after this point, actually, where John himself is arrested, John the Baptist, John the Baptizer. Uh, he's arrested and thrown in jail, uh, primarily for speaking out against Herod Antipas and his illicit relationship with his brother Philip's wife, uh, this adulterous uh, marriage that he'd entered into. And John openly spoke about it. He condemned the whole thing and everything. Well, eventually, uh, we won't... Uh go too far into it, but uh, you know, Antipas is having a party, and his wife and uh, his daughter, uh, his, uh, we don't know if it's his daughter or his uh, daughter through, uh, or his niece necessarily, but uh, it's his wife's daughter, and uh, he is so enamored with his daughter, and don't, don't let the sickness of that escape you, just to give you a sense of the culture of that time and Antipas' problems, but Antipas is so taken with this, this daughter and her dancing for him, and, and uh, her mother recognizes this and uses this opportunity. Again, she's no prize herself. And so she convinces her daughter to dance for him in such a way as he'd be willing to potentially make oaths and promises and such, and sure enough, he does. And, you know, ask what you will, half the kingdom if necessary. And so she confers with her mother and says, what should I ask for? And he says, well, I want the head of John the Baptist. Why? Because he's been condemning their relationship, and she found a way now to silence him. He regrets what he did, but he follows through with it nonetheless, and he has John beheaded. Well, here John is at the beginning of this ministry. It's actually during that time he's in prison that he sends two disciples of his own to Jesus and says, Are you the one or should we look for another? 
Uh, and I always like to bring that up because we're reminded of the fact that even great men of God, great men and women of God who serve him faithfully and are called clearly, still have moments of, of ups and downs, highs and low ebbs, if you will. But again, as we've repeated before, that sort of forgotten beatitude, blessed are those who are not offended by the way I run my business. God does not always do things the way that we would expect him to. And that John experienced that. But that being said, uh, here John is at the beginning of his ministry. He's, he's made known who the Messiah is, and now he's watching to see what's next. And as Jesus comes walking by, he once again declares, Behold the Lamb of God. And two of the disciples of John who hear this begin now to follow Jesus. And we'll find later on that uh, as more and more of John's disciples begin to follow after Jesus and more and more people begin to follow after Jesus, a couple of John's disciples will come to him and they'll say, Master, the people are starting to leave us and follow him. And John says, well, that's as it should be because I need to decrease, but he needs to increase. He is, in fact, the forerunner. He's not the Messiah. He's not the Savior himself, but he's a, he's a roadmap. He's a sign. He's one to indicate who the Messiah was. And now he is all too glad, no doubt to see his own disciples begin to follow Jesus. The first two of those are mentioned here. Uh, the first, and by the way, I should point out that over this week and next week as we look at these and then the next uh, couple that follow after him, uh, this account is different than another account in Matthew and Luke in particular where Jesus now calls James and John and Andrew and Peter from their fishing nets and from their, from their livelihoods to come follow him. These are two separate events. This is now the very first time that John and Andrew, who are the two disciples in view here, meet Jesus. These are different uh, events. This is a prior event to that official calling. This is actually where Andrew, and he's not named here, but it's generally pretty much universally held that we're talking about John as the unnamed disciple here, the apostle, the writer of the gospel. And so here we have now their first encounter personally with Jesus. And they begin to follow him. And again, as the language would imply, they became his followers at that point. In other words, they had exchanged, they had transferred, if you will, their discipleship of John to this point, and now they had attached themselves to Jesus. And they begin to literally start by walking where he's walking, and they're following after him. Uh, so you can imagine the picture. As, as, as they're standing with John watching, and he makes this announcement, and it would have been interesting to hear the conversation that takes place. I mean, it, when you see these things, I should just mention that these things are happening to real people in real space and time in real life. It wasn't like, you know, John said, behold, the Lamb of God. And they just sort of went, OK. And they just began to follow. It wasn't like some kind of zombie sort of effect that they had. But rather, they likely looked at John and, and said, should we go? And what, what do we do? And they began to sort of make the motions to recognize this is the one that John had been speaking about. That didn't mean it was easy to necessarily leave John behind. But there is now a relationship that is being transferred from being a disciple of John the Baptist to being a disciple of Jesus. And I make this point because the idea of being a disciple is a significant one. A disciple is somebody who is a follower, a learner, somebody who makes it a point to be as much like their master, the one they're a disciple of, as they possibly can. They listen to the words they say. They follow their mannerisms. They look at the way they deal with situations and circumstances, and they try to emulate that. Now, I will tell you, as a young pastor, I could very much relate to this idea. Uh, chances are that when I, if you had heard me preach some of my early sermons, you would probably have heard my senior pastor in much of what I said. You would have heard of other pastors that I really liked, people like Dave Rosales or Joe Foch or some of these guys that were hugely instrumental in in my life growing up as a Christian. You would have heard their kinds of things or maybe even the way they said certain things because I so listened to them and tried to learn and glean from them. Uh, you know, I don't know that I would have said I was one of their disciples per se. I would say I was one of my pastor's disciples in a way because he was modeling for me, as were some of my very close friends, what it meant to be a Christian. And so discipleship isn't just, hey, that's pretty cool. No, I, I want to be like you. I want to, you know, people that have arrived at a place in their Christian lives are people that we want to emulate. We want to be like. We want to be where they are when we get to their stage in walking with Jesus. Well, there's something similar about what's happening here is John and Andrew have been following John. They've been learning what it means to prepare their hearts for the coming of the Lord. And now he's come and they want in. 
They want to follow after Jesus, and so they do. And so they depart from John, and they become disciples now of Jesus. Now, again, Andrew... Um, becomes the first one to follow Jesus, Andrew and John. He's the first one named that we see. Uh, so let's camp on him for just a moment because Andrew, you know, there are some disciples that when you say, list the 12 disciples of Jesus, who's the first one that generally comes to mind? Peter, right? You think of Peter, or you think of John, or if you think a little more deeply, maybe, well, Matthew was a gospel writer, and he followed after. And so you start thinking through the list of names. By the time you get to Bartholomew or somebody like that, you're kind of forgetting who's all part of the team. But the idea is that you, you think of certain disciples, and generally speaking, most people don't name Andrew first. And it's because you don't know much about Andrew. The Bible doesn't say a lot about him. But what it does say about him is significant. Andrew is one of the very first people to acknowledge and follow that Jesus is the Messiah. He is the Savior, the Lamb of God. He is following. He's committed himself to him. Now, I will also say that, and we'll see this as we go through the gospel, and as we no doubt will draw from the other gospels as we go, that you don't see Andrew a lot, but there is something significant about almost every time you do see him, and that is that almost every time he comes up, he is somehow connected with bringing somebody to Jesus. Whether it is uh, the kid with the loaves and the fishes, or whether it's his own brother Simon Peter to start with, or whether it's the Greeks that say, we would see Jesus, and Andrew kind of is involved in getting them together. Uh, you don't see him a lot throughout the Gospels, but when you do, you tend to see him in that light. As a matter of fact, there's only one sermon that we have really recorded of, of Andrew's, and it's this one where he goes to get his brother. We found the Messiah. Now, that was profound when we think of the implications of that, uh, of that message coming. But Andrew is somebody, uh, interesting, whose, whose name means manly. Uh, Andrew is a fisherman like Peter. I'll call him Simon at this point. But Andrew and Simon were fishermen. They were sons of their father, whose name happened to be John, and they grew up, no doubt, learning from their father this craft, and they were fishermen, which meant they worked hard. Uh, most of the time when we think fishermen, we're thinking Babe Winkleman or somebody, you know, just kind of soaking the line out there on a boat. No, these are guys that literally would take nets, big nets, and they would... They would cast them out into the water, and they'd pull them in. And a lot of times there'd be some fish or no fish or sometimes a lot of fish, and they'd heave and hoe until they got all this stuff in the boat. Then they'd untangle the nets and get all the fish out, do their stuff. Then they'd throw it out again. They would do this all day from early in the morning until later in the afternoon when the time for fishing really was kind of over, when they weren't biting anymore. But all day they would do this. Talk about a workout. You know, chances are most of the people we read about among the disciples, uh, certainly Jesus himself, these were not scrawny little measly guys. These were men who worked, who worked hard. Andrew's a man. This is a guy who, uh, and I say that because sometimes we sort of imagine uh, followers of Jesus as being soft. Uh-uh. Uh-uh. What was James and John's nickname? Sons of Thunder. Those sound like bikers to me. Okay, sons of thunder. We don't even know why Jesus calls them that, by the way. We assume it's because it has, you know, maybe they're, you know, later on they come and they want to call fire down from heaven on these towns that reject Jesus and stuff. But that's not when he calls them that. It's in Mark's gospel when he, when he names the 12 disciples that he calls James and John Boanerges, or sons of thunder. I don't know why, but from the outset, this is what they're kind of known as, or at least Peter's recounting that as he is sort of the source for Mark's gospel in that. Well, Andrew's a fisherman. This is a tough dude. You wouldn't arm wrestle a guy like this. And he's the first one to follow Jesus, he and John. Um, Again, we don't see a lot about Andrew, but it is significant what we do see about him when we do. Um, and also, I'll mention this before we move on, Andrew's also... He's not all the time part of that inner circle of Jesus, which is generally made up of Peter, James, and John. However, there are occasions when he does show up in that circle. I think one, but generally it's Peter, James, and John. But Andrew is part of that at one point. Um, so he is one of the close friends of Jesus. And he's one, again, he's, he's among the two earliest followers of the Lord. Now, 
John is the other one. He doesn't name himself here, and again, he doesn't really name himself in the gospel. Nevertheless, he does refer to himself, probably most famously, as the disciple whom Jesus loved. Now, I will say that I'm looking forward to meeting him to ask him why he decided to refer to himself that way. Uh, did, he, did he somehow mean to distinguish himself from the others and say, Jesus loved me more or some kind of a thing? I don't know. We'll find out. But he does, he does appear at times during Jesus' ministry in those times in that inner circle. In the Last Supper, he's the one sitting next to Jesus, puts his head on Jesus' chest. He followed not just, he didn't just follow, but you get the real sense that he followed closely after Jesus. John's one of the two with Peter, who is among the, uh, the only two disciples who run to the tomb after the testimony of the women to go see for themselves. Uh, and so John is somebody else who, who, again, follows the Lord. Now, of course, John is also somebody uh, who uh, is prominent throughout the gospel story. He's not like Andrew in that you don't hear much about him. He appears much in the Gospels and also in the book of Acts early on in connection with Peter and their ministry. John would write three letters, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, and he would write the, the, the Revelation. Interesting uh, thing about James and John, that, uh, and I'll, dis I'll, I'll exclude Judas from this because he betrayed the Lord, but of those who followed the Lord after the resurrection among the apostles, James is the first one killed, and John is the last one who dies. Uh, As we read through the gospel accounts, and eventually when we uh, get back into Acts at some point, um, you know, when James is killed for his faith, that's John's brother. They've been following the Lord from the earliest days, and his brother now becomes the first of the apostles to be martyred. Well, that means something to a brother, right? How many of you have a, a sibling, a brother, especially a brother? Raise your hand if you've got a brother. Uh, well, those of you who grew up with brothers know that bond. You fought, you argued, you wrestled, you hurt each other, but you're tight. Now that you're grown-ups, those things built a relationship that is very deep and meaningful. It's, it's hard to even explain that, I'll bet, in some respects. Well, John was killed for following Jesus. And then later on, at, uh, in his 90s, John ultimately uh, dies as well as the last of the apostles to die. Um, I'll also mention that it is, um, uh, it is uh, John and James who, uh, whose mother comes to Jesus one day and says, when you come in your kingdom, I'd like my sons to sit at your right hand and your left. Now, it says the other disciples were indignant at them because of this, probably because they didn't think of it first or their moms didn't show up and go to bat for them. But James and John are in on this thing with their mom, and their mom asks about this, and, she, and Jesus says, you don't know what you're asking. Are they really ready to be baptized in the fire I'm ready to be baptized in? And they say, we are, you know. Well, it wasn't too long after that that their mother and John himself were among those at the cross with Jesus, with one on his right hand and one on his left. And I wonder if that question came back to their minds at that moment when Jesus said, are you ready? Because this is what it looks like. So, James and John. Well, John, again with Andrew, comes uh, and becomes one of the first of Jesus' followers. Um, now, notice here, as they're following him, back in the gospel here in verse uh, 38. And Jesus turned and saw them following and said to them, what are you seeking? And they said to him, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? By the way, you'll see throughout the gospel that there are times when John translates a word. Like whether it's here with Rabbi or uh, Messiah means Christ. Uh, he is saying this to his broader audience. Uh, clearly, any Jews reading this would understand those ideas. But he's, in, he's also translating some of these terms for those who are not Jews who would be reading this gospel. And so he lets them know when we say Messiah, what we mean is the Christ. In other words, the anointed one. They would know the word Christ. When he says rabbi, they wouldn't know rabbi per se. And rabbi means more than just teacher. It means my great one. The one to whom we are disciples of is the implication in this word, in this context. It's not just teacher in some sense, but rather somebody that I am going to personally learn from. So it's a little bit deeper kind of an idea there. And, they, and he says to them, what are you seeking? Uh, it is interesting that these now become the first recorded words of Jesus in John's Gospel. And that's a significant thing. 
When you read the other gospel accounts, it's always interesting to see what the first thing Jesus says is. In Matthew's gospel, he identifies with us. When John says, I should be baptized by you, you should be baptized by me. And Jesus says, let it be done to fulfill all righteousness. And then he's baptized by John by one of his own creation, if you will, among his own people, and he is, allows himself to be baptized. He is identifying, in a sense. Uh, in Mark's gospel, the first thing we see Jesus say is after the baptism, uh, his baptism, when he says, uh, he speaks about the kingdom, and he calls people to repent. It's a call of people to change their minds, and Mark's gospel moves very, very quickly and very succinctly through the account. Luke's gospel, uh, he identifies uh, with the father when in the temple, uh, his parents are looking for him as a boy, as a 12-year-old, and they realize as they're leaving Jerusalem after a festival that their, their whole family is left and everything, and they're going, but all of a sudden they realize that Jesus is gone. Now... There's a part of that that I love as a parent. Uh, you know, it's funny. You think, now Jesus, Jesus is the Messiah. Joseph and Mary know he's, there's something special about Jesus, their firstborn. Well, Mary's firstborn, right? He's born of the Holy Spirit. He is Emmanuel, God with us. He'll sit on the throne of his father, David. He'll save his people from their sins. This kid is somebody special, if I can be sort of maybe just casual about that for a minute. Nevertheless, they lose him. They lose him. They have a normal life with him living in the house. You'd think... If there's one of the kids that's going to be left at, left home alone or whatever, you know, it's not going to be Jesus, right? But they do. There's something kind of endearing about the normalcy of such a thing. You know, we, uh, and again, I, I, I like to sort of bring us into the gospel story and remind us once again, these are real people living out real things and trying to sort it out as they go. Uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, I feel like there's a certain mission in my life as a Bible teacher to make sure that none of us have sort of this view of the Bible happening in some fairy tale land while real life happens somewhere else. No, the gospel story happens like it, it could happen in our time today. Like it, it happened among normal people. Yes, sir. Did I bump loose? Did I kind of... I don't know what happened there. Are we good now? Not good? Sorry about that. Did I bump something? Are we? Okay. Well, I'll tell you what. Let's grab this thing. Let's grab number one. Let's just use that. We'll improvise. The other forgotten beatitude is blessed are the flexible, for they will not get bent out of shape. So, there we go. How's that? Is that a little better? We bring it up a little bit. That should work okay. All right. Well, again, for any of you who didn't catch that, I, I just think it's really important that we remember that, you know, the, 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 the things we read about in Scripture didn't happen in some sort of Neverland kind of a place. They happened in real life among real people. And when we read the gospel accounts and we see these things and we understand it in that light, it makes the gospel actually jump out even more because we realize that when they react to things, they react like we probably would if we were the one that it was happening to. Uh, if, if we think about Mary and Joseph raising Jesus, what on earth could that have been like? You know, the most obedient kid ever that never did anything wrong. What did his brothers and sisters think about that? You know, you think Joseph's brothers and sisters didn't like him. It's possible that James and Jude didn't like him very much at times. You know, who knows? But the point is that these things happen among real people. And here comes Jesus at 12 years old. And he's in the temple with his family. And they're there worshiping and such. And they all leave afterward, but they forget him. They don't realize he's gone. They assume he's with the group somewhere. And they assume that, and so they leave. And it's three days, was it, was it three days later? I forget. But sometime later, they all of a sudden realize, wait a minute, where is he? So if it's three days later, then it's three days back, right? So now basically a week has gone by, and they've not seen him. And they find him, and they're looking around Jerusalem for him. Well, where do you start? Well, they go to the temple, and there he is. 
and he's sitting there and he's having discussions, deep, meaningful, surprisingly mature discussions for what the priests think about spiritual things. And they come and they find him in there and they're like, you know, how could you not be with us? How could you do this? You, we were like, they're worried sick. And Jesus said, here's the first words. Didn't you know I'd be in my father's house? Now, never mind how you might respond to that kind of an answer as a parent. But the fact is that his first words in Luke's gospel are his identification with who his father is. Significant first words, right? Well, here in John's gospel, to bring us back, the first thing that we see Jesus saying is a really profound question. What are you seeking? What are you really after? Uh, I don't think it was a casual question, although it, it may have been asked in somewhat of a casual way. But when you consider what's going on here, Andrew and John are, are becoming disciples of Jesus. And he says, what are you looking for? What are you seeking? What ultimately is the reason for why you're doing this? What are you looking for? Um, In their culture, they had certain ideas about what the Messiah would be, and we've talked about this a little bit, but their expectation was that the Messiah would be a military leader to come and overthrow the yoke of Rome. He'd set up his throne in Jerusalem and rule and reign, and Israel would be in its proper place as God's chosen people from which the Messiah would come and rule and reign. This was the predominant view of what the Messiah would be. And so when Jesus says, what are you seeking? Well, because they are looking to him as the Messiah, because John's the forerunner of the Messiah, and he has just directed them to him, no doubt, at least in some degree, this is what their expectation is. But Jesus asks, what are you seeking? Um, most of us, when we come to Christ, and sadly, far too many people today, when they hear the name Jesus, have a very, at the very least, incomplete view of who he is, and at worst, have a really, really bizarrely distorted view of who he is. Uh, as a matter of fact, when you watch some of the preachers on TV and the way that they talk about Jesus and his desire to make you rich and prosperous and healthy all the time and you should never be sick. Come to Jesus and everything's going to be awesome. That's a really distorted view and, and, and to say the least a very incomplete view of who Jesus is. But if people come and respond to that they're coming to a different Jesus than the actual Jesus. And if Jesus were to ask the question, what are you seeking? The answer would be, I want to be healthy. I want to be wealthy. I want to live like a king's kid. Uh, if we teach that anybody who's sick following Jesus will be made well, that's not always true. You know, and there are plenty of biblical examples of those who followed after God and followed hard after God who suffered physical hardships. So when we say, well, come to Jesus and he'll heal you. Well, we believe he can, and we believe he often does. I'm not in any way diminishing God's healing power or his desire to do so in many cases. But he doesn't always. But when we sort of lead people to think that he always does, what are you seeking? I want to be healed. Okay. Well, what if he doesn't live up to your expectations? What if he doesn't live up to the expectations that you have for him? Will you walk away or will you maybe reconsider your expectations and ask whether or not they are legitimate? Am I loving God because of what he does for me or gives me or am I loving God for who he is? Now he has done something for us as believers that is beyond anything we could ever ask, right? We're saved. Our sins are paid for. We know that we have a future and a hope that is Irrevocable. It's something that God has promised and sealed us with the Holy Spirit as a guarantee. We will inherit that one day. But here in life, there are no promises of being made well or made rich. So if he doesn't meet your expectations, then what? And here's the, here's the rub. If he doesn't change, will you? If he doesn't change to meet your preconceived ideas, will you change to line up with him? What are you seeking? I don't think it was a casual question at heart. I think there was something a little bit more profound about it. And the answer 
And uh, I have to admit, I've always kind of viewed their answer to this in sort of a funny way, probably because I just think that way. But um, some of you may have seen uh, years ago, and uh, did I mention this actually? I think maybe at the nursing home, but. Um, there is a one-man play that Dean Jones did called John in Exile. How many of you have seen that? Not many, right? Oh, someone has, right? So uh, I still have it. Maybe one day we'll show it. But it was—it's—I haven't watched it in so long. It may be wildly dated or something. But um, but there's he John uh, Dean Jones plays the part of John and he tells the story of his life with Jesus from the point of being an old man now on Patmos. And as he recounts the story, he recounts this incident. And they're following after Jesus, and they're so excited to finally meet the Messiah, and they want to be his disciple, but they're following at a distance because they don't really know how to engage him, and they're nervous and everything. And Jesus turns around and says, what are you seeking? And their response is, uh, well, where are you staying? You know, like they're, they don't, they're totally caught wrong-footed or something. I used to always kind of think of it that way. I just painted a picture in my mind. And there may have been some sort of, you know, awkwardness about that exchange. I don't know. But the truth of the matter was uh, that very likely what's going on here is that they are confirming to him that they want to learn from him. They're confirming their discipleship to him. Where are you staying? We want to spend time with you. Like John has told us about you, but now we want to get to know you ourselves. We want to come to be your disciples. And so they do. They, and Jesus responds and says, come and see. Another profound thing. Come. Gentle invitation. Well, come on. And the promise, the ensuing promise, you will see. Um, there is a beautiful truth to the fact that God will often show us things, as it were, or do things in our lives that will help us know that he's not only real, but that his desire is for us to know him and to walk with him. And sometimes we come to faith because he has shown us whether he has done something in our lives. Maybe maybe he, he brought a healing and now we realize like, wow, yes, I do need to follow after you. And then we follow him for the right reasons after he does something for us. Uh, or maybe it's because someone explained things about our faith. For me, it was getting explanations and answers to questions, uh, which, again, God did provide that through people who answered those questions for me and helped me to come to know who Jesus really was. And so, in a sense, I was, you know, uh, see and then come. And that's not an invalid thing per se. But for any of us who have come to know Jesus personally, chances are that you have come to know him in a way that is a little bit more lined up with what he says here. Come and you'll see. And we have come to see things from God that we would never have seen had we not first come to follow him. Matter of fact, what kinds of things? Later in the Gospels, he'll, he'll, he'll speak to this very thing. He talks about how, matter of fact, with these guys, as he calls them, as he calls the disciples, he eventually says, you will be fishers of men. Follow me and I will make you. Okay, you're fishermen now, but you're about to become something more when you follow me. He talks about a future and hope that is yet to come. Why? We will see it later because we came and followed him. The Holy Spirit will lead you into all truth. These are things that believers get to experience because they have become believers. And now they begin to see things uh, in, in, in God's furthering, leading us along in that kind of a thing. Well, they're now hearing this for the first time. Where are you staying? Where can we go to sit and listen to you tell us the things of God? Where can we become, where can we learn what it means to follow you? Come, and you'll see. When we share the gospel with people, um, and again, forgive me if I say these things, you know, periodically, and if you're tired of hearing them, but when it comes to the gospel, it's important that we recognize that people need to come to know the person of Christ personally. It's not about coming for something that he'll do. It's not about coming because he's going to give you something other than forgiveness, right? That's huge. It's hard to parse that. But the idea is that it's not, we're not coming because the rent's going to get paid or because I'm going to get healed or because, uh, or because I've got a wayward child or something. That's not the primary reason why we follow Jesus. As a matter of fact, if I ask you why you're a Christian, the answer should be because it's true. Okay? Truth is true and therefore becomes the anchor for all other things. And so we follow Jesus because it's true. Well, what is true in, as well about following Jesus? That from time to time, it will be unbelievably blissful. Yes, but other times it will be very, very hard. 
Uh, Paul would say, all who seek to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. When Jesus prayed for his disciples in John chapter 17, not only his disciples immediately, but all of those who would believe because of their testimony, he says, Father, I don't pray that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the wicked one. Well, what does that mean? The wicked one's coming to harass us. Difficulties will come. Trials will come. What are you seeking? Will you follow him because it's true, or will you only follow him because the weather is fair? That's a really important question that we ask, and also it becomes a very important undergirding principle, underlying principle of sharing the gospel. Hey, come on, you'll get some candy, kid. No, that's not what it is. Is there, is there joy? Joy inexpressible and full of glory. Not only when one's coming, but even in life now. I have to tell you, there are times, uh, uh, and I, I'm thankful for how God sometimes does this, but after, you know, sometimes long after, or maybe immediately, in my case, it tends to be after I've had some time to sort of process some things that God has brought us through. And I'll, I'll go back and I'll realize a lesson that he taught me, and I'll realize the value of that lesson, and I will rejoice, literally. Like, I realize, okay, not only am I happy to know there was a purpose behind that, but you've actually let me know what the purpose was. And I realize that this is something that wasn't a terrible thing meant to destroy me, but it's actually been intended to build me up. Well, there's joy in that. And that's something someone in the world can't necessarily understand. Come and you will see. Follow him. And there is more that will follow after that. Now... Coming back to verse uh, 38, uh, or verse 39. So they came and saw where he was staying, and they stayed with him that day, for the hour was, or for it was about the tenth hour. Now, that either means, by Jewish reckoning, that it was about four in the afternoon, or by Roman reckoning, which many people think is probably more what's in view here, it would have been ten in the morning. And when it says they spent the day with him, that's probably more the case, uh, rather than four o'clock when it's going to be the end of the day. Although we don't know for sure, uh, and that may sort of uh, speak to when Andrew then goes and finds Simon. He either they started early in the day, toward the end of the day he went and found Simon, or they started late in the day, and maybe it was the next morning or something. We don't really know. But we do know that after they spend the day with him, uh, it says here again, one of the two that heard John speak and follow Jesus was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. By the way, at this stage in the actual story, he's only called Simon. As a matter of fact, John goes back and calls him Simon in a moment, but he mentions him as Simon Peter here. Why? Because about 25, well, you know, 60 years after the events, everybody knows Simon Peter. And so he can say, well, this is Andrew, this is Simon Peter's brother who went and found him. Um, and by this time, everybody else who is an apostle has passed away. As a matter of fact, Peter himself, Simon Peter, who John is referring to here, at this point, has already been dead for about 25 years by the time John writes. Again, just to kind of put our heads into where we are as we read this. So John is remembering this whole account. Also, by the way, I think it's significant. A.T. Robertson pointed this out. I, I thought it was a great little insight. But all these years later, John remembers the, the hour that he met Jesus. I thought that was just precious, you know. Here was about the 10th hour of the day. and. And they spent their time with him. So he says, Andrew is Simon Peter's brother, and Andrew went to go get him. He first found his own brother, Simon, and said to him, we have found the Messiah. Again, which means the Christ, the anointed one. He brought him to Jesus. Again, here's our first example of what we tend to see as, as a pattern with Andrew, is that he brought someone to Jesus, first and foremost, his brother. He brought him to Jesus, and Jesus looked at him. For your notes, this happens to be the same word that Luke uses when he, when he describes Jesus looking at Simon Peter after he denies him three times through the courtyard. So here Jesus looks at Peter, gives him that sort of, you know, just whatever that means. He just looked at him at that moment there and said, you are Simon, the son of John, and you shall be called Cephas. Now. By the way, it is pronounced Cephas. Uh, that's a kappa that starts the name. Uh, it's Cephas. I, it's, if you want to say Cephas, no one's going to give you a hard time about it. But if you want to just for that sake, it is actually pronounced Cephas. But you're Simon, son of John. Now, Simon 
uh, Simon means herd, and uh, Simon is a derivative of the name Simeon. Simeon was the second son uh, of Jacob. Now, Simeon, similarly, now again, it, in, in biblical culture, a lot of times people would name their kids with somewhat of a prophetic sort of connection with it. There was something about the kid that they would connect with this. And uh, Simon is a derivative of, of uh, is derived from Simeon. Well, Simeon, interestingly, uh, had a bit of a rash streak in him as well. Uh, as a matter of fact, it is Simeon and Levi who caused great trouble for Jacob as they wipe out all the men after uh, these guys had attacked their sister. And so they go in and they wipe all these guys out kind of rashly. And Jacob says, what have you done? You've brought trouble to me because of all of this and everything. Well, as it turns out, Simon himself has a bit of a ready fire aim kind of a thing going and so there's I don't know if there's some connection with that when uh, when his own parents named him but Simon son of John he and Andrew their father's name is John you shall be called Cephas now think for a moment Andrew goes and he gets Simon his brother we don't see a lot about Andrew as I've said but think about what came out of Andrew going to get his brother and bringing his brother to meet Jesus. We don't have pages and pages and pages of stuff on Andrew, but we have pages and pages and pages of stuff on Peter, Andrew's brother. I may have asked you the question before, so if you know the answer, don't say it, because I always love to see the searching look on people's faces when I ask. Have you ever heard the word or the name Edward Kimball? If you have, raise your hand, but don't say who it is. Edward Kimball, okay. Only a couple people. How many of you have heard of D.L. Moody? D uh, Dwight Moody, D.L. Moody. He was a great evangelist from Chicago who was led to the Lord by Edward Kimball in Sunday school. Now, we don't have pages and pages and pages on Edward Kimball, but we got volumes on D.L. Moody, right? Whatever part in the body you play, your simple testimony about Jesus can have a far long, longer lasting impact than you ever can imagine. Look at what Peter accomplished. Peter becomes not only a pillar in the church, but he becomes uh, the, uh, the writer of two incredibly profound uh, epistles. He becomes the elder statesman of the church later in his life. He becomes the one disciple about whom we know most in the Gospels, and he becomes really the, the disciple as a relationship with Jesus that tends to be the one that we focus on most of all. Uh, Peter is a disciple who is about as common and ordinary a person as anyone in this room, and yet he is used so profoundly by the Lord. Warts and all, with all of his heights and lows, you're the, you're the Christ, the Son of the living God. Well done, Peter. You didn't say this of your own doing, but your Father in heaven has told you this. Well, great. Now I'm going to go and be crucified. Not so, Lord. This will never happen to you. Get behind me, Satan. Wow. That's, you're not even on the next page. You know? That's, but that's Peter. We love Peter, right? Peter came to know Jesus because Andrew brought him. We don't know a lot about Andrew except, wow. You know, um, whatever God's called you to, don't think it a small thing. Don't think it a little thing. Uh, what is it? Um, oh, gosh. Someone can call it out if you can remember the quote. But um, where, where I, don't despise the days of small things, right? Don't despise the days of small things. Um, what God can do through a simple testimony is remarkable, and that's Andrew. Um, and then lastly, I'll just kind of mention as, as we uh, look at Peter for just a second here, too, and then we'll finish for today. But um, as, as Peter, again, this, this, is, this is the meeting before the official calling. John doesn't record the official calling where all of a sudden now he names the 12 and everything. We just sort of see the disciples are added, and then all of a sudden we see the ministry of Jesus open up. It's earlier in the other gospel accounts where we begin to see the 12 and how Jesus calls the twelve, but they don't include this, this earlier meeting. And so John has given us an insight here as one who was there to see it, and he tells us about this meeting. And I, I you know, I guess I'll close with this thought. <laughs> you know, there, as, as, as Jesus meets Peter and says, your name is Cephas, which is the Aramaic for the, for the, for the, uh, for the Greek Peter or Petros, which is the masculine for the word stone. 
And I won't get into the whole thing today about, you know, the, the rock and the church and that whole kind of a thing. But, but, but Jesus, once again, what, what you don't see right now what's about to happen in your life and what you're going to become. But I'm going to name you something that's going to be very telling about your role in the work that I'm going to do. And this is the beginning of that story. So when you read about Peter, you read his letters or we see him come up in the Gospels or any of those things, this is where it all started for him. Uh, and we'll see more as we go. And I guess I'll just kind of stop there. But um, any questions before we pray together? I love that we're small enough to do this. But uh, no. Okay. Well, then what we'll do is we'll take our time here as we close to pray together. As always, if anyone has to go, you feel free to do that. Um, but uh, we're going to take just a few moments here and pray together. Um, we want to lift up anybody maybe in our families. Uh, there's a lot of people that are sick among us, and we know God always heals. So, uh, no, but we want to pray, right? We want to pray in faith knowing that God may heal. And may, in fact, matter of fact, James tells us that we have not because we ask not. And sometimes we're even asking according to our own desires in that. But when we ask anything according to his will, John would say, we have what we ask. And so let's come before him and let's ask, as Jesus said, ask, please ask, and keep asking. Knock, please knock, and keep knocking. So when something comes to your heart, please feel free to uh, open that up. I'm going to go ahead and start us, and then we'll pray. Father, we thank you for our time here in your word this morning and in worship. And most of all, as these things are reflective of, thank you for just giving us this time to, together in your presence. We thank you that your Holy Spirit takes your word and brings it into our hearts, and it never returns void. Your word will accomplish what you set it forth to do. So we pray that here in this place, in our hearts, that it's found fertile soil from which to bear great fruit. So we pray that you bless that. We also thank you that, uh, Father, as we walk through life together, that we, much like those even in the Bible itself, are very ordinary people through whom and in whom you've done extraordinary things. It's never about what we are or what we bring to the table, but rather it's just simply about a vessel that you can fill, that you can fashion and form into something useful for your purposes and for your glory. And so we thank you that you would see uh, really fit, fit to do that in each one of our lives. So do that, Father. Have your way in us as we commit ourselves to you as your followers, your learners, those who seek to be like you, your disciples. And, Father, as we spend this time in prayer, we just pray that our hearts would just be in tune with yours as we just pray for those things that are according to your will. Father, we do pray for the sick among us. There are those who are ailing from seemingly simple kinds of things, but others are going through a little bit harder things. We pray for Perry. We know he's had some kidney stones. He's going to have hip surgery soon. We pray that, Father, you'd have your hand upon him and just help him to be well, whether it's just healing him outright or whether you're going to use the, the skills that you've given so many in the medical field to do these kinds of things. We just pray that you would have your way and just, just uh, make him whole. For those who are ailing with sicknesses, Father, we pray that you would just remove those things and heal our bodies, that we'd be free of those hindrances. And we also thank you for how you have healed uh, so many, Lord, that have been sick that we've been praying for. And so thank you for that, Father.
Father, we pray for our young people as well, uh, our, our kids, our teens. And Father, um, there's so much richness to a relationship with you, and there's so much distraction in the world that keeps them from, uh, from applying themselves to that pursuit. And we just pray that, Father, you would help their hearts and minds to engage with you, that, Lord, their desires would change and their desire for you would increase. And that, Father, they would not see Jesus as somebody to follow just simply at times when it's, you know, maybe appropriate like a Sunday morning or something, but rather I pray that they would begin to see how you work your way into every part of our lives and how you become the Lord of every moment. Uh, Lord, how you're not a God who's afar off and reserved for certain circumstances, but how you desire to be the Lord of our lives in full. And so we pray for them, Father, that they would come to experience the joy of knowing you and following you, that they'd walk in your ways out of intention and desire, and they would reap the, the beautiful reward of knowing you better, and that their lives would be made whole through that. So many of them are lonely, and so many are seeking to have needs met in places that are harmful and, and certainly leading them away, and they're it's the world they live in. But I pray that, Father, they come to recognize that you are the answer to all of their longings. Let's stand together. Father, you're a good God, a loving Father, a compassionate, gracious, forgiving, restoring, refreshing, providing. Father, the adjectives go on, but Lord, you're all of these things. And we thank you for the grace that you've shown us that we might be free and able to walk with you with a sense of peace, really the peace of God because we have peace with God. Thank you that you sent your son to pay for our sins once and for all. That all that remains is for us to receive your grace and accept that beautiful and precious gift. Thank you, Father. Lord, we love you, we bless you, and praise you. And again, we pray that you'd help us to be your disciples as we walk with you and follow in the footsteps of Jesus, in whose name we pray. Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you every hour. Every hour I need you. My one defense, my righteousness. Oh, God, how I need you. Let's sing that again. And, Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour I need you. My one defense.
defense, my righteousness. Oh God, how I need you. Amen. Amen. God bless you all. Have a great week. Thanks for coming out this morning, and we'll hopefully catch up with you this week.